Investors who are concerned about volatility in their portfolio might add in a bond index fund to their asset allocation in a proportion that matches their risk preferences. An allocation to bonds reduces expected returns, but it also reduces expected volatility. But what about investors who are not concerned with volatility and are willing to take on even more risk than the stock market as a whole has to offer? There are two options for these investors, reducing diversification or using leverage. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you how leverage can boost your returns and why it needs to be used with caution. If you have committed to being an aggressive investor, you might allocate 100% of your investments to a diversified portfolio of stocks. If you believe in the long-term positive returns of stocks and you are comfortable with risk, you might want to get even more aggressive. One approach to getting more aggressive is focusing on only the riskiest stocks in the market. Instead of buying a total market index fund, you might find the 50 smallest and cheapest stocks in the market and only invest in those. Remember, a cheap stock, a stock with a low price relative to some fundamental measure like earnings or book value, is a stock that the market is pricing as risky, leading to higher expected returns. Reducing diversification has some obvious disadvantages. It decreases the reliability of your outcome, and it increases exposure to the specific and uncompensated risk of the relatively few companies that you own. Instead of building a concentrated portfolio, a more theoretically sound approach to increasing expected risk-adjusted returns would be building a well-diversified portfolio and then increasing expected returns using leverage. In a 2012 paper from AQR, the author suggested that most investors will choose concentration over leverage because concentration is more conventional and feels less risky. But leveraging a well-diversified portfolio actually leads to a better expected outcome than an increasing concentration in risky assets. The definition of well-diversified is debatable. Lots of literature suggests that even a total stock market index fund is not well-diversified because it is concentrated in a single risk, market risk. Adding in independent risks like those of small stocks, value stocks, profitable stocks, and other alternative risk premiums might lead to a more reliable result. For our purposes today, let's assume that you have a portfolio which you have deemed to have optimal risk-adjusted expected returns. All right, let's talk about leverage. Investing with leverage means getting more exposure to an asset than the amount of your own money that you have invested in it. Leverage comes in many forms, including derivatives, but for now, let's focus on borrowing money to invest. If you have $100,000 of cash to invest in an optimal portfolio, and that portfolio returns 10% over some time period, you will have $110,000. If you took your $100,000 and borrowed another $100,000 to invest alongside it, that 10% return would leave you with $220,000. $100,000 of that is not yours, but once you pay it back, you will still have $120,000, doubling your return from 10% to 20%. That sounds pretty good, but leverage has sort of an evil twin on the downside. In our example, a $10,000 loss would turn into a $20,000 loss, but a 50% loss would turn into a 100% loss, meaning that all of your money is gone. All of these examples ignored the cost of borrowing, which is important. If you make 10% with borrowed money, but it cost you 10% over the same time period, you've gained nothing. The desire to borrow to invest is not without basis. In a 2008 paper, and again in a 2010 book, Ian Ayers and Barry Nellebuff, both professors at Yale, argued that it is sensible, even responsible, for young investors to use leverage. The argument is based on the fact that when we are younger, we tend to have much less cash to invest, but need to maintain lots of exposure to stocks. Even a young 100% equity investor with only a few thousand dollars to invest is allocating way less to stocks than they optimally should at that stage of their life. The solution, as you may have guessed, is to borrow to invest in stocks when you are young and gradually decrease leverage over time. This results in more consistent exposure to stocks through your investment lifetime, and as Ayers and Nalibuff demonstrate, a much better expected outcome. This argument for using leverage to gain time diversification makes logical sense. The longer that you maintain exposure to stocks, the more reliable your outcome is going to be. For a young investor with little to invest, using leverage allows for increased exposure to stocks early on. Lots of people already do this when they use leverage to buy a home, but it's a little bit different with stocks. Even with the possibility of total loss for a young leveraged investor, Ayers and Nalibuff explain, Investors only face the risk of wiping out their current investments when they are still young and will have a chance to rebuild. 
Present savings might be extinguished, but the present value of future savings never will be. Our simulations account for this possibility, and even so, we find that the minimum return under the strategies with initially leveraged positions would be substantially higher compared to the minimum under traditional investment strategies. All right, we have established that leverage is a sensible approach to increasing your expected returns, and some literature even suggests that it is the most responsible approach for young investors building wealth for retirement. The practicalities of borrowing to invest are important. Lenders are more willing to lend you money when they think you will be able to pay it back. The riskier that you look to a lender, the more they will charge you to borrow money. If you own a home outright, or at least with significant equity, you can borrow against it. This is easily the cheapest form of debt available in Canada. The lender feels safe securing a loan against your home. You can use a home equity line of credit or a traditional mortgage to borrow against a home. If you use a home equity line of credit, it is important to note that the loan is callable. The bank can change the terms of the loan at any time, even at a time when your investments have declined substantially. If you don't own a home with meaningful equity, the interest rate on an unsecured line of credit is probably going to be too high for the purpose of investing in a diversified portfolio. The interest rate will likely be higher than the expected return. I don't think that I even need to mention that using a credit card to make a leverage investment is probably not a good idea, but I mentioned it just in case. If you have taxable investments in a margin account, you can use a margin loan, which is a loan against the investments in your account to gain access to more capital. Because the loan is secured against your investments, the interest rate will tend to be lower than an unsecured line of credit, but it is generally higher than a home equity line of credit. When you take a margin loan, you are exposed to the risk of a margin call. The loan is not allowed to exceed some proportion of your account, depending on the assets that you own. Say it's 50%. This means that if you have $10,000, you can borrow $10,000 on margin. 50% of your account is a loan. If the investments that you have used to secure the loan decline in value to the point that your loan exceeds 50% of the portfolio, you will need to cover the difference. This is called a margin call. If you don't have cash to add to your account to meet the margin requirement, the financial institution may be allowed to sell some of your investments to cover the loan. This scenario creates a downward spiral of selling investments that have declined in value, which is not ideal for obvious reasons. In all of these cases of direct leverage, it is possible to end up in a net negative position, having nothing left in assets and owing money to a lender if your investments decline below the value of your invested equity. One perk for this approach to leverage investing is that as long as you're investing with borrowed money in a taxable account with the intention of earning income, the interest on the loan is tax deductible in Canada. While limited access to cheap debt, callable loans, margin calls, and the risk of a loss greater than your initial investment may be a deterrent to leverage investing, there are financial products that have been designed to overcome most of these issues. Leveraged ETFs are ETFs that you can buy without using leverage yourself that give you access to a leveraged investment. Take the ProShares Ultra S&P 500 ETF, SSO, as an example. It is designed to deliver two times the returns of the S&P 500. The most important thing to understand about leveraged ETFs is that they are designed to match the leverage returns of an index for a single trading day. A long-term investor might not expect the full amplification of returns if they are holding it for periods longer than one day. We are going to discuss this in detail. Over a single trading day, you expect to earn a multiple of the underlying asset's return. If the index goes up 5%, your 2x leveraged ETF should go up 10%. The challenge comes when the fund resets its leverage at the end of the day. Let's think through the process of managing a leveraged ETF. If a leveraged S&P 500 ETF has $100 million in assets, it might invest $80 million in the S&P 500 and use the remaining $20 million to enter into futures contracts and swap agreements to gain another $120 million worth of exposure to the index. This works perfectly on day one. Say the S&P 500 delivers a 5% return. The fund will gain $10 million. But on the next trading day, the fund has $110 million in assets. Remember, the total exposure to the index was only $200 million yesterday, meaning that with $110 million in assets, the fund is no longer 2x leveraged. It has to use derivatives to increase its exposure. The result to the fund holder is that they are buying more stocks when the index increases and selling stocks when it decreases. Most importantly for a long-term investor considering a position in a leveraged ETF is that in a volatile market, the rebalancing effects of a leveraged ETF could be detrimental. This phenomenon has been examined both theoretically and empirically. In the 2010 paper, Path Dependence of Leveraged ETF Returns, Marco Avellaneda and Stanley Zhang 
suggest a formula that predicts the relationship between the returns of an underlying asset and the leveraged ETF tracking that asset. The paper was in the Journal of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, so I wouldn't get hung up on trying to understand the equation. But the relevant takeaway is that there is a time decay associated with the realized variance in the returns of the underlying asset. In the same paper, the authors empirically verify that the expected time decay relationship holds true in live leveraged ETF products. The result for a long-term investor is that you would not expect to achieve the long-term leverage return suggested by the name of the leveraged product. This relationship can work out in your favor, but it works against you when the market is swinging between positive and negative returns. Another way to think about this is that in addition to leverage exposure to the underlying asset, a leveraged ETF investor has negative exposure to the variance in returns. If variance is higher, leveraged ETF returns will be lower. The final point on leveraged ETFs is that they come at a price. SSO has an expense ratio of 0.9%, 10 times higher than an unlevered S&P 500 ETF like SPY. It is important to note that I am not saying that leveraged ETFs are bad. They do deliver the leverage return of an index. The point of this discussion is that they are designed to replicate the daily leverage returns of an underlying asset. The ProShares webpage for SSO offers a concise description of why this might be relevant to a long-term investor. This leveraged ProShares ETF seeks a return that is two times the return of its underlying benchmark for a single day, as measured from one NAV calculation to the next. Due to the compounding of daily returns, ProShares returns over periods other than one day will likely differ in amount and possibly direction from the target return for the same period. These effects may be more pronounced in funds with larger or inverse multiples and in funds with volatile benchmarks. Other than the time decay that we've been discussing, there is research suggesting that the easy access to leverage offered by leveraged ETFs is priced into the asset. In a 2011 paper titled Embedded Leverage, Andrea Frazzini and Lasse Peterson found that assets with high embedded leverage, including leveraged ETFs, have lower expected returns. In other words, the easy access to leverage is priced into the asset, reducing its expected returns. In summary, leveraged ETFs will deliver the daily leverage returns of an underlying asset, but their long-term buy-and-hold outcome can be materially affected by volatility, and some evidence suggests that the embedded leverage is priced in, reducing expected returns relative to a directly leveraged investment in the same underlying asset. The practical challenges of applying leverage to a portfolio that we've discussed are only the tip of the iceberg. The real challenge is behavioral. We know that most investors are badly behaved at the worst possible times. This is why many people allocate a portion of their portfolio to bonds. It helps them to stay invested. Being a 100% equity investor is behaviorally risky for many people, and leverage is going to amplify that behavioral risk. There are some pretty good arguments that leverage is useful in building wealth, as long as you can stay invested, even after a total wipeout. If you do apply this strategy, whether through direct leverage from a loan or embedded leverage in a financial product, I suggest that you proceed with caution. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital, and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. Don't forget, if you've run out of Common Sense Investing videos to watch, you can tune into weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.